So yeah, hey everyone, uh, my name is Melanie Yazi. I did this during our brief colloquial presentations a couple of weeks ago, but uh, for Diné relatives in the room especially, uh, it's important as a Diné person that I identify myself and establish or my kinship with Diné relatives in the room. Um, I also just wanted to say really quickly that my uh, paternal grandmother's clan is Ma'ile Shkizhni, which is actually a clan that emerged out of the intermarrying between Hamas Pueblo folks um, and Diné folks. And so here I am in Pueblo territory, even though a lot of my relatives um, come back and forth through places like Santa Fe and Albuquerque, I just want to acknowledge my Pueblo relatives, um, the Hamas lineage that comes in through my clan, Ma'ile Shkizhni, and the incredible work, um, the resistance and the resilience that you practice here in your territories. So I just wanted to say that to open. Uh, I also wanted to thank SAR for giving me the space to be able to talk about this work, but more importantly, um, you know, to give me a, a break from teaching and the service work that I think anyone who's a faculty member or a former, former faculty member in academic institutions know take up a lot of time. I really value teaching and actually service, um, particularly community service. I do a lot of political organizing in, the na in and around the Navajo Nation and Reservation border towns. Uh, is an essential part of my research. It's who I am as a person. It's how I identify myself as a Diné woman. Um, yet that takes up a great deal of time, right? And so the time and the space to be able to write, to really think through and to grapple with the tough things that I'll partly be talking about today is really important to have a really quiet space that's open for that kind of consideration and work. And so thank you for you know, choosing me for this fellowship because it actually gives me that time and space. It's incredibly valuable. So I'm gonna read and talk, ad lib a, bit, a little bit, but I'm mostly gonna read, which is the convention of my field. I got my PhD in American Studies at the University of New Mexico a couple of years ago. Um, but before I begin, I wanted to uh, provide a brief caveat about citation. Um, I think this is being recorded right now. It's actually a bit important, if that's okay. Um, for me, sometimes it's worrisome. Um, that the careful labor of scholars and activists, especially those who are junior like me, uh, is sometimes taken for granted by scholars, journalists, and other activists um, who use the ideas or the analysis of the person presenting, in this case me, uh, without citing us who are presenting. Um, I think there is sometimes an unspoken and somewhat unethical convention, particularly in the academy, that if something isn't published, then maybe we don't have to cite it correctly. Uh, Talks like this that are given are often works in progress that are in the pipeline for publication, right? A lot of what I'm sharing today isn't published. Some of it is, and I'll show you the citation so you can look at it if you want to read more about it. Uh, but they still very much exist in the ether of like, things like conference presentations, YouTube videos, and proposals for publication. And especially given that this is being recorded and distributed widely via YouTube, I wanted to remind everyone watching and listening to respect the years, right, of careful, difficult labor that I and others put into our work and to cite it when and if you use it. Uh, we produce knowledge so that others might be inspired by our work, which is incredibly thrilling, or you might just find something useful in it, but it's important to maintain an ethics about the labor that actually goes into the work. And given that I'm talking about the very real challenges that my own indigenous nation faces on a daily basis, and given that there's a long tradition of theft and erasure from indigenous people, knowledge, land, patrimony, I don't think anyone wants to participate in this particular tradition of theft <laughs> by using something I say today without proper citation. Two thumbs up. All right, thanks for everyone who's gonna be watching this hopefully long into the future as it goes into the interwebs and takes on a life of its own. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to, brought, to start today uh, by providing a brief layout for my talk. Um, what I'm presenting today is something of a mashup from my dissertation work, versions of dissertation chapters that have been revised into articles and pieces of my first book, which is the major project I will be completing during my tenure here at SAR. All of this is very much a work in progress and I'm still very much working through the ideas and the central tenets of my argument that I'm presenting today. Uh, nevertheless, what I am presenting, I think represents a general direction for the book, meaning it gives listeners a good sense of the general contours and arguments and perhaps the relevance of the book to the various sort of histories and, and academic sort of theoretical interests I'm working through, while also offering something of a roadmap of my own intellectual and political development. Uh, this project and the ideas that I'm working through in it began over five years ago with the biopolitical critique of liberalism that became the basis for my doctoral comprehensive exams all those years ago. Around the same time that I was advancing towards candidacy in my degree, I became politicized 
and began to do intensive frontline political organizing with poor, mostly urban indigenous folks about issues ranging from LGBTQ2 rights to ending racist violence against unsheltered relatives in reservation border towns, to abolishing racist imagery, holidays, and mascots, to resisting the legalized theft of water from Diné people, and encouraging tribal officials to enforce a form of sovereignty that might protect us from this theft as Navajo citizens. So what organizing taught me is that liberalism is really just settler colonialism and capitalism by another name. And by this, I mean that liberalism is the primary delivery mechanism for biopolitics, which Michel Foucault famously called the blood that has dried on the code. My understanding of this key phrase, the blood that has dried on the code, which comes at the end of his lectures in the volume titled Society Must Be Defended, is that the code of which Foucault speaks is liberal discourse. Codes are signs or language we develop to represent societal values. Two key examples of a code in a liberal democratic context like the United States might be the nation state or the law. It's the discourse that we create to organize our worldview into existence and then to exert order in that world that we create. The blood that Foucault speaks of is the material violence that made and continues to make this order possible. This is a very Marxist method of understanding, I'm a hardcore Marxist, <laughs> and the, an the analytics and the politics that, that really drive my work. And so this is a very Marxist method of understanding power. It's about uncovering the exploitation, in other words, the violence, that makes the structure of capitalism tick, right? Because capitalism has a very intimate relationship with liberalism. And because discourse is uh, primarily defined as the abstraction of materiality, the transmission of materiality into codes and symbols means that the actual violence that animates and energizes liberalism dries up, right, in the process of abstraction. It is distorted, erased, and concealed. So a biopolitical critique of liberalism that I studied all those years ago when I was advancing to candidacy then seeks to uncover, to remind us, of the bloody toll that liberalism exacts on and from racialized and colonized poor of the world, from peoples who are deemed exploited and surplus by the logic of capitalism, including my own people, the Diné. So the political and structural backdrop for my talk today about liberalism and biopolitics seeks to address and uncover the extreme violence of settler colonialism, capitalism, and I talk a bit about heteropatriarchy, that is so often delivered through while also being concealed by liberal platitudes about growth, development, progress, and healing. And I focus on the politics of relational life that Diné freedom fighters have formulated in order to uncover and condemn what I call ontologies of death that describe the lived experience of this violence that so profoundly conditions indigenous life and history. And given the overwhelming evidence of this violence to be found in the historical record, in oral testimony, popular culture, narratives from the state, et cetera, the archive is really long, the archive of this violence, I want to conclude my talk today by commenting very briefly on the kinds of political and ethical commitments to accountability I think scholars need to develop, and some are already doing this remarkable work, and do better at articulating in a historical moment when the world is often literally on fire, and when we cannot ignore the violence that conditions our collective history, and if we do not organize this violence into oblivion, our collective future. But before I get into all that, <laughs> I want to preface my discussion about resource extraction, which is, after all, the title of my talk, by talking a bit about a prior period in history that I also cover in the book, shaped by a form of liberalism that was experimental by design, and which deployed a biopolitical preoccupation with life that came in the form of Navajo studies, which emerged in the 1940s as the primary field of study pertaining to all facets, I mean, a very comprehensive field of study about Diné life, and I start with this history to lay a bit of the groundwork for my analysis of how the ideology of liberalism works with the structure of biopolitics to reproduce and deliver death even whilst it promises life. And so the death of indigenous life, of course, is the underlying goal of settler colonial logics of elimination that work through practices of capitalist exploitation and heteropatriarchal violence to do their work on behalf of US nationalism. And in a liberal nation state like the United States, Liberalism effect effectively operates to uphold settler orders and settler supremacy. The history of Navajo studies, Navajo development projects, Navajo Indian administration, I'm talking about the federally funded administration, state administration of Navajo affairs, and Diné resistance all demonstrate quite convincingly that biopolitics is the primary method of colonial intervention in a political order such as the United States structured by liberalism. And so this constellation and intersection of structures of power, ideologies, materialities, political formations, 
and ultimately battles over the very terms of history and futurity in the flesh are really what the book is about. So I'm going to give you a little bit. Oh, there's, so this is, if you want this from me, this is the article. So part of my talk today is actually published already. The article came out a couple weeks ago. Um, but some of this stuff about experimental liberalism I'm going to use as a preface to moving into the resource extraction section um, hasn't been published and is very much part of the, the book project. So if you, want, if you want to get this from me later, I'm, I'm happy to give you the exact citation. So I just wanted to provide you a map um, just so you kind of have, I'm so Navajo-centric that I'm like, everybody knows where I'm talking about in all of these locations. Uh, but this is the, the political boundaries of what is today in 2018 known as the Navajo Nation. The Nebekeya, which is the actual title from the talk, right, as it was advertised, um, and what brought us all here today is typically sort of the Navajo phrase for how we understand sort of the political entity of the Navajo Nation. And this, minus the checkerboard, um, the checkerboard isn't really represented on the eastern side. This is the Navajo Nation politically, the entity we know as the sovereign Navajo Nation today. Um, the title of the talk, I actually changed it, if you caught that, to Nihikeya. And I actually get this from Lloyd Lee, who's a fellow Diné scholar, Diné studies advocate. Um, and this means something a bit different. And I think it, it means something in, in sort of akin to the relational life I'll be talking about at the end of the talk. And as Lloyd Lee defines it, Nihikeya means the land that the people live and walk upon called home, right? And so there are different understandings of our relationship to what we understand as Navajo land. And so I thought that the juxtaposition between those two uh, is important and hopefully it'll become apparent why it's important. So I'm just gonna begin with the uh, experimental liberalism part. So as Thomas Lemke notes in his discussion of Foucault's definition of biopolitics, biopol quote, biopolitics stands for a constellation in which modern human and natural sciences and the normative concepts that emerge from the structure, from, that, from them, sorry, and the normative concepts that emerge from them structure political action and determine its goals, end quote. Navajo studies emerged in the 1940s as an integrated and applied field of knowledge fed by numerous social and scientific disciplines. Navajo studies legitimized and gave shape to the normative concepts about indigenous life that underwrote the evolving paradigm of Indian rehabilitation that was captivating technicians of mid 20th century colonialism and liberalism at that time. Formed by John Collier, one of the most important protagonists in the history of 20th century US indigenous relations, and his intellectual contemporaries in fields like anthropology and sociology, Navajo studies assumed Navajo life as a grid of intelligibility for testing the principles and efficacy of what Alyosha Goldstein calls the gospel of growth, a mid-century form of liberalism characterized by discourses of development and preoccupations with economic expansion. All facets of Navajo life underwent various academic and governmental experiments under the guise of Navajo studies, to determine the conditions under which Navajo people, land, animals, water, and plants, in other, in other words, the totality of what might constitute Diné life, could be made most available for economic development schemes devised according to this gospel of growth. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, or the IRA as it's commonly known, which was the hallmark piece of legislation that articulated Collier's vision for Indian rehabilitation, required the mobilization of thousands of administrators, researchers, and Indian advocates to staff its numerous political, economic, and social development projects. Of particular importance for carrying out IRA mandates were academically trained social scientists, who Collier saw as instrumental for creating the optimal conditions for Indian rehabilitation to take permanent root in Native societies. Collier recruited the help of prominent mid-century American anthropologists to create test sites, what he often called laboratories in tribal communities across the nation. The purpose of these test sites was to examine local conditions to determine the most effective course of action that Indian administrators might take to ensure that the principles of rehabilitation would become normative structures in Indian life. As his correspondence shows, Collier was close with many anthropologists who had made their careers out of studying Navajo life in particular. Not coincidentally, all of these major figures within American anthropology also held official positions within US Indian administration and Navajo administration in particular during Collier's tenure as commissioner of Indian affairs. Between the late 1930s and early 1960s, Collier and other social scientists authored and collaborated on hundreds of authoritative studies, books, and articles on Navajo life, effectively creating the field of Navajo studies and forming its canon out of the overlap between social scientific research and the administration of IRA-style federal Indian policy. 
as Clyde Cluckhone, a prominent anthropologist, and Dorothea Layton, a psychologist and wife of Alexander Layton, another prominent anthropologist, argued in their 1946 book, The Navajo, social scientific research in Indian policy had a profound symbiosis in the context of Navajo administration. Indeed, the marriage of the two was all but necessary for implanting the philosophy and practice of rehabilitation in Navajo life. In the book's preface, they provide a synopsis of this view, stating, quote, in an endeavor to meet the highly critical situation of the Navajo since 1933, the government has drawn on the resources of many physical and social sciences, ecology, agronomy, animal husbandry, medicine, education, and others. Whatever its defects, the government program has been, without a doubt, one of the closest approaches yet achieved to an intelligent, planned, and integrated application of scientific knowledge to the practical affairs of a whole people." End quote. This passage is striking for me. <laughs> Cluckhorn and Layton identify a range of academic disciplines deployed on behalf of post-1930s Navajo administration. As a whole new regime in discourse, politics, and forms of knowledge, Indian rehabilitation gained legibility and material influence, at least in part through the development of several new disciplines of knowledge, whose main objective was to categorize, classify, and assign value to all forms of Navajo life. Disciplines like ecology, medicine, and agronomy worked together in the field of Navajo studies to develop a comprehensive mapping of Navajo life, one that functioned as an animating structure for liberal development schemes, of which Indian rehabilitation was one iteration intent on changing Navajos and other native people into responsible, self-sufficient citizens. And these are words that Collier uses a lot in his writings about this. I contend that Indian rehabilitation with Navajo studies as the knowledge formation animating its primary goals was a biopolitical project. Focused as it was on shaping and conforming Diné life towards the interests of the gospel of growth that Goldstein talks about, Navajo studies in particular served to, de served to develop the normative concepts like development, rehabilitation, and self-sufficiency, all liberal idioms, of a particular biopolitical project that assumed Diné life, again, as its primary site of intervention, and as I note above, its grid of intelligibility. However, whereas Indian rehabilitation was envisioned and implemented as the harbinger of development, political prosperity, and economic growth for Navajo people, indeed, these liberal in indexes of what qualifies as life itself, for Native people, in reality, these liberal projects functioned as a false politics of life that masked the ontologies of death that rehabilitation spread. Indeed, despite Collier's exaltations about the unique quality that Indian rehabilitation possessed to transform Indians from a condition of death to a condition of life, everyday Diné people consistently resisted rehabilitation schemes, arguing that rehabilitation was actually taking life from Diné people by encroaching upon Diné political and social authority and by killing an important element of the Diné approach to life, sheep. The first, this first wave of resistance occurred in the 1930s, following Collier's plans to reduce Navajo livestock, primarily sheep, and install an IRA-style government. As historian Peter Iverson notes, for Diné people, the sweeping program of livestock reduction, which was implemented under the guise of Indian rehabilitation, caused massive trauma within the Navajo world. Indeed, for Diné people, Livestock reduction was an assault on their entire way of life, which had happened previously when the long walk of the Navajo or Huelde had threatened the total elimination of Diné life. And this was our death march to Fort Sumner, which is now in eastern New Mexico. Um, and we were able to return in the latter in the 1860s, but this is something that's part of the oral history of colonialism that Diné people share, even passed down through generations in our families. And so Marilyn Help, a Diné elder, stated in a 2001 interview with Iverson, quote, I think my people really got hurt by the livestock reduction program because they are really close to their animals. Our people cried. My people, they cried. They thought this was another huelde, long walk. They asked the government, why are you doing this to us? You gave the animals for us to use, and now you are turning around and killing our livestock, end quote. Another Diné woman relayed the story of her husband's death, which she directly linked to livestock reduction. My husband said, you people are heartless. You have now killed me. You have cut off my arms. You have cut off my legs. You have taken my head off. There's nothing left for me. It wasn't long before my husband fell ill, she said, and at the beginning of spring, he died. These words from the mouths of Diné women who remembered the impact of livestock reduction on their everyday lives tells a story of death and catastrophe 
that stands in stark contrast to the story of life and triumph proffered by the prevailing discourse of progress that dominated the liberal discourse about Navajo administration in that era. As I have argued elsewhere, mostly my dissertation, struggles over life and death continue to shape the persistent refusal on the part of the Negro grassroots people to acknowledge and accept the violence of liberal development ideologies like rehabilitation in the 1930s and 40s, and today, extraction-based development schemes. It is therefore from the Dine people themselves, both those in the 1960s and 70s, who define themselves as activists challenging resource extraction, and community members like those who have long interpreted livestock reduction as the death of Dine life, that I draw my argument regarding this politics or this ontology of death, underwriting the increased normalization of liberal, i.e. biopolitical modalities, right, in everyday Dine life and governance. Moreover, I argue that the salience of this politics of death across various periods of Diné history, spanning from Puelde to what John Redhouse, who's an important figure in the history of Diné resistance, has termed the dark period of the fossil fuel age of the 1960s and 70s, helps to explain the comprehensive, I think they're comprehensive, discourses of life that have served as the centerpiece of various iterations of grassroots Diné political action since the 1930s, and, and possibly also back to the period of Puelde but I mostly do 20th century history. So through his voluminous research in the 70s and 80s, Red House uncovered a vast network of connections between multinational resource extraction corporations, tribal governments, US politicians, and other actors that extended through and beyond tribal lands and boundaries. He concluded that the extraction of resources on Navajo land was linked to a larger system of extraction, exploitation, and profiteering, characterized by what he called a grand plan for the colonization of Navajos. He frequently employed this framework in his writings to trace connections between different forms of violence in locations like Black Mesa, which is right here. That's Black Mesa. Uh, Farmington, right there, and then Gallup, right? So we're talking about a huge span, um, spans actually, of land. And so he frequently employed this framework in his writings to trace connections between different forms of violence and locations like Black Mesa, Farmington, and Gallup, where the logic of extraction had transformed everyday social relations into a, into a war over life and death. And wars, I mean, if you go into reservation border towns, there's definitely kind of warfare that continues to happen. And so in Red House's mind, what was occurring through murderous violence and racism in industry-driven reservation border towns had everything to do with the extraction of life happening through mining, forced removal, <coughs> and disease in rural parts of the Navajo reservation. <coughs> Where industry operations had also set up shop. Both locations were geopolitical coordinates connected through an economic network of extractive practices that were destroying the land, killing sheep, killing people, uprooting families from their homes, and alienating people from their entire way of life. Pauline Whitesinger, a big mountain matriarch, who was prominent in the struggle on Black Mesa to resist forced relocation in the 1970s and 80s, likened this network of extractive practices to, quote, putting your hand down someone's throat and squeezing the heart out, unquote. <clears throat> it's a really long quotation, I'm going to read it. You can read it along with me. In a particular striking passage from his self-published memoir, Getting It Out of My System, Red House describes this economic network and the visceral and violent terms of death that extractive economic practices were imposing on the Diné, even as tribal politicians increasingly opened up Diné lands and bodies to service economic deals with resource extraction corporations. Quote, I grew up in Farmington in the 1950s and 1960s. It was a typical border town, racist as hell. There were the usual local rednecks. They didn't like Indians, but they liked our money. And then came the boomers, the white oil field trash from Texas and Oklahoma, who were as dangerous as they looked. They hated blacks in Texas and Oklahoma, but since there were very few Negroes and a whole lot of Indians in the new energy capital of the West, we, the local Indians, became their target. The energy boom of the 50s and 60s brought the boomers, and that's when Indian killing became a regular sport in Farmington. They would kill you just because you were Indian. So we grew up fighting during that particularly violent period. We had to fight back to survive. And while we were fighting for our lives, we realized the supreme irony that most of the energy that made Farmington a boom town came from the nearby Indian reservations, and that much of the water in the rivers which flowed through our tribal lands 
were used for regional energy development, which benefited not only the area boomers, but large off-reservation non-Indian populations in big cities. Oh my God, we were a colony, an exploited energy and water resource colony of the master race. The colonialism was by design. The exploitation was part of a grand plan. And we in the border town ghettos were fighting the sons of the colonizers and exploiters who had set up shop. Oh, honey, thank you. <laughs> who had set up shop and were running their resource raids out of Farmington. We, the indigenous people of this land, were being screwed, coming and going. I just want to point out here, uh, especially in a place like Santa Fe that prides itself on a version of New Mexico history that paints a picture of tricultural harmony, reconciliation, and peaceful coexistence. Um, these are all liberal narratives, right, that are proffered in many of the museums in the city and the state. That the picture that Red House himself paints in this excerpt, excerpt is a poignant description of the current, not the past, reality for Native people in this state. It's the reality that we continue to endure, and in fact, not much has changed since the 1970s. Indian killing is still a regular thing that happens in border towns. Um, and that the struggles that Diné and Pueblo people face in this region mirror the circumstances that he articulates in this excerpt almost identically in 2018. And so in this lengthy passage, Red House draws material connections between the violent culture of Indian killing in border towns like Farmington and the resource raids like coal and uranium mining occurring in other parts of the Navajo Nation, the profits of which literally fed border town economies and, the, and thus directly fueled Indian killing. For Red House, extractive practices trafficked in Indian killing on multiple levels, including murder, harassment, exploitation, the plunder of water, and as he would later argue, forced relocation and what he called the rape of the land. So Red House frames the multiple modalities of death and violence at the heart of extraction in a strikingly similar way to indigenous feminists who have been writing about extraction more than 30 years later. In partnership with the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, the Women's Earth Alliance released a report in 2014 that documents what it calls environmental violence. Environmental violence entails, quote, the disproportionate and often devastating impacts that the conscious and deliberate proliferation of environmental toxins and industrial development have on indigenous women, children, and future generations without regard from states or corporations for their severe and ongoing harm, end quote. The report cites more than a, do a dozen indigenous feminist land defenders who draw from their autobiographical experiences as indigenous women, as well as their activism and advocacy regarding sexual violence and resource extraction, to argue that resource extraction is fundamentally violent. These indigenous feminist land defenders also point out that the violence of resource extraction affects not only the lands that are plundered and pillaged during resource raids, to, to borrow Red House's term, but also the bodies of indigenous people and women, youth, and LGBTQ2 relatives in particular. And so this land-body relationality is bound by and through in the sort of the framework of envir environmental violence by an intergenerational toxicity that's caused by industrial pollution, often as a result of resource extraction. The land-body relationality that these indigenous feminist land defenders uncover as central to environmental violence echoes the connections between Indian killing and resource raids, which occur at the respective sites of body and land, that, re that Red House draws from his own frontline experience as a Diné land defender in the 1970s and 1980s. The structural portrait that Red House, Women's Earth Alliance, and Native Youth Sexual Health Network paint is one of violence and death, unequivocal violence and death. And so in addition to having roots in Marxist critiques of capitalism, my critique of the violence that underpins liberal, liberal development comes directly from indigenous feminist and Diné land defenders who draw connections between the everyday lived material realities of environmental violence and larger structures of settler colonialism, capitalism, and heteropatriarchy. These connections are key for understanding the politics of life espoused by big mountain matriarchs like White Singer and Benali that emerged to contest these material realities of environmental violence and death, masquerading as liberal promises of development, life, and growth. The Guatemalan activist Sandra Moran provides a framework that is useful for interpreting this politics. She writes, quote, women resist because they defend life. The extractive model kills life, impedes it, transforms it. The defense of life is in the center of resistance. And as women, we have always been at the center of taking care of life, end quote. In the following passage, Ruth Benali suggests something similar 
when she claims that the Diné have a right to live freely on the land in Big Mountain and other parts of Black Mesa because they have a deep relationship with the land, one that infuses their sense of self and their entire understanding of reality. Quote, the law says that sheep are not allowed here, but we hold on to them. We learned how to live by taking care of the livestock. It is like the cornfield. There are many ways to prepare corn and use the pollen. The pollen is used by healers in the blessing way ceremony. So that we never lose the memory of a cornfield, we have a natural kinship that is woven into the land. It is how we walk on the land. That is why even when we are told no, we have to resist. We do not want to live in any other way." End quote. Rowan Batsui and Kenja Hassan echo this understanding, and I think this provides like sort of a larger an analysis for Benali's comments. Navajo's obligations to the earth, to their family and community is their purpose in life. All of these things that are important to them spiral back to the land itself. The land is the center of their orientation in experience and the base of their sense of reality and identity. To separate them from it would cause them to lose contact with all that is sacred and holy to them. To force people to live such a life of meaninglessness is a condemnation to a slow death." End quote. As these two passages imply, the land-based paradigm that emerged from the context of these women's resistance to forced removal had at its center both an unwavering critique of the almost totalizing death that extractive practices represented to Diné worldviews, and a framework for Diné conceptions of life rooted in one's relationship with the land and responsibilities to life-giving forces and beings like sheep, corn, family, and holy beings. As Benali points out, this relationality comprises the entire Diné worldview and orients an ontology that exists always in relation to or in kinship with an entire web of relations that have specific connections to specific places. In other words, through the act of resisting forced removal, these women enacted a politics of life that was both defensive, as in to defend life against the destruction of death by extraction, is both defensive and generative, as in to caretake life through an ethos and a practice of kinship obligation. This dual move of defending and caretaking relational life is at the heart of the Diné concept of ke, which I invoked at the beginning um, to introduce myself, which is still widely practiced as a social and ontological custom in both Diné resistance struggles and in just everyday Diné social life. I argue that this turn towards life has energized and shaped the sort of politically, speaking politically now, the now popular phrases, um, or water is life, mini wichoni was also something that was invoked, um, that had become a signature for indigenous struggles like the stunning effort to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline in Standing Rock in 2016 and 2017, and the lesser known but momentous Nihigal Beyina effort, which means journey for our existence, which was a walk across the Navajo Nation led by Diné women and youth in 2015 to document the beauty of land and people and how that beauty is being desecrated by resource extraction. As it has been invoked within indigenous resistance struggles, water is life represents a set of assumptions and values that represent a radical departure from those that drive liberal determinations of life that have actually brought harm and death to the Diné and other indigenous peoples. These assumptions and values are premised on an embracement of relationality in which the responsibility of being a good relative to all of one's relatives, including other than human relatives, like land, plants, water, animals, and ancestors, becomes the priority and the basis for political organization and action. Like the Women's Earth Alliance and Native Youth Sexual Health Network, indigenous women and those who are writing and organizing within the framework of indigenous feminism have articulated what I think is the most comprehensive theory of this relationality. Uh, Winona LaDuke, for example, has argued that, quote, Native American teachings describe the relations all around, animals, fish, trees, and rocks, as our brothers, sisters, uncles, and grandpas. Our relations to each other, our prayers whispered across generations to our relatives, are what bind our cultures together, end quote. And indigenous feminists like Eileen Morton Robinson and Mashana Goman have long emphasized that indigenous feminist praxis offers a scale based on connection that collapses the settler scale that separates humans, lands, and animals. These indigenous feminists collectively articulate a theory of connection in which relationality and movement define ontology rather than the bounded individualism that functions as one of the primary 
organizing principles for biopolitical modalities and liberal modalities, right, of time and space. <coughs> In his edited volume, Bitter Water, uh, Diné Oral Histories of the Navajo Hopi Land Dispute, Malcolm Benali documents oral histories of resistance relayed by these big mountain matriarchs, including the two I quoted earlier, uh, Ruth Benali and Pauline Whitesinger. Bitter Water includes a chapter entitled Sheep is Life, which in Diné Bazaar is the Debebeina, in which editor Benali weaves together these women's definitions of the phrase sheep is life. Like the values underlying the phrase water is life, Sheep is Life offers a similar theory of politics premised on a definition of life rooted in a philosophy and practice of relationality. <clears throat> Donna Haraway, famous cyborg feminist, who writes about human-sheep relationality on Black Mesa, argues that the interconnection between Diné women and sheep offers fertile ground for, quote, cultivating a multi-species justice, end quote. Notions like Sheep is Life demonstrates what Haraway calls a sympoesis, or the making with that characterizes the complex, dynamic, uh, responsive, situated historical systems of kinship and materiality. The question of justice, what some who write and organize about resource extraction call alternative futures, <coughs> has been a central concern of the posthumanist ethics that Haraway has contributed to academic knowledge about relationality. As one of the primary scholarly threads feeding the emerging project of energy humanities, Post-humanism post urges scholars and historical actors to develop theories and methods that address the necessity of constituting new worldviews and modes of action appropriate to the recognition of ecological interdependency and interresponsibility. Now, I just want to point out that neither Haraway nor any scholar working in post-humanist traditions is offering any new insight into relationality uh, that has not already been expertly theorized and practiced by Diné and other indigenous people since before the advent of the United States and American academic institutions, right? It's important to point that out. However, I do see the work that's emerging from the interdisciplinary crossroads of energy, humanities, posthumanism, queer affect is another field I work in, and indigenous feminism as a sign that intellectuals writing from both the front lines of indigenous resistance and academic positions cited in institutions, there's not, the line between those can sometimes be blurry, are formulating a politics of relational life that can serve as a form of multi-species justice, to use Haraway's term, which White Singer, Benali, Goman, Morton Robinson, Leduc, Red House, Haraway, and Mohan all point out as a critical and necessary framework for liberating all life from the death grip of the hegemonic formation of extractivism and its liberal valence of development. So that's the talk about the book. Um, I said that I would close really briefly with some comments about what this work, and particularly my experience with organizing, has taught me about what, what is the purpose and the spirit of our intellectual labor when we're talking about uh, very real battles over life and death, right? So to, to be able to abolish extractivism in Navajo Nation would actually require two very radical things. It would require the abolition of the United States as we know it, <laughs> and it would actually require the abolition of global capitalism, right? Because I think as my analysis shows, they work in tandem through liberal and biopolitical modalities to constantly reproduce sort of the hegemony where violence is, is, ex where violence is exerted on only certain populations that are deemed disposable or surplus, right? The exploited labor that makes the internal engine of capitalism continue to grow that that would have to, that whole system and that whole equation of life and death would have to be fundamentally shifted. And so in the Red Nation, which is this revolutionary organization, indigenous-led revolutionary organization that I work with, we espouse anti-capitalist and anti-colonial politics because we understand structurally sort of big picture that this is actually what we need to be organizing towards if we want to have a future. And not just a future for my own people, you know, in the, the lands that Nehikeya, the larger geography that this map represents. But for all relatives, right, human and other than human relatives, we live in an era of climate change, right? Um, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings are happening right now, so we live in an era where heteropatriarchal violence is being called out in a way that it hasn't been ever, <laughs> and I'm not sure I ever thought would happen during my lifetime. And so we're seeing the confluence of uprisings of indigenous people. Um, I'm just talking about the United States, the teachers, uprisings, right? 
the youth who are rising up against gun violence. We're seeing Black Lives Matter, right? Uh, the, the, the prisoners strike that happened at the end of August. All of these different sex sectors of the colonized and racialized poor, right? The exploited class, the classes of the United States are rising up in different ways and it just keeps happening every month or two, at least in the last year and a half in the United States. And what this is showing me is that there's a rising consciousness. There's something that's growing. There's a possible shift in the hegemony. There's rumbling, right? If all of these different sectors of these different, right, these different sectors of the racialized class um, that is racialized by the logic of capitalism and by the logic of liberalism are rising up. And so what does it mean then to be talking about history and to be talking about these issues in the real world, right? The, the live action craziness and terror <laughs> that we're living in. I think it's important to read the current historical moment and then the work that we're producing uh, not just as one that is incredibly depressing and devastating, right, because the level of violence is really quite overwhelming that we're confronting collectively um, as human beings, but that there's also strangely, somewhat perversely, but it does exist, an incredible opportunity for like truly changing structures of power in this moment. We're in some sort of death knell, death knell or reemergence of something. And this is my sense as somebody who's engaged in organizing very deeply embedded in the kind of work that people are doing to push revolutionary struggle forward, for example. And so when I talk about these issues and the reason why I wanted to present this and make sure that this was caught on camera for those who are gonna be watching this on YouTube is that I encourage all of us who are intellectuals of, of history, who are intellectuals of the traditions of resistance that drive our work, if that is what we're doing, to have a much clearer sense of our political and our ethical commitments right, to how history informs how we struggle now and how our intellectual practice or our intellectual praxis actually can help us struggle better so we can just win. So we can win whatever struggle that we're in together. And this is a deeply sort of moralistic and an ethical kind of call to action, right? But it is something that is constantly guiding my work and really happened when I became much more of a frontline political organizer and how that's informed the way I go about the work. So I just wanted to close with that and I really look forward to comments and questions and answers, um, the question and answer session for the talk. Thank you. Go ahead.